Anybody out there? Good morning. Okay, great. Just want to make sure. Uh, for those of you uh, in the museum, if you want to come on back to the uh, back portion of the museum, we have a tremendous program lined up for you. Imagine flying 3,000 feet. Suddenly your engine begins to run a little rough. You do everything you can. You start thinking, hmm, I've, I've got a problem here. What do you do? What if you're over water somewhere between Florida and Haiti and things are not going well and you have your daughter with you? So it's not just you, it's you and your, a member of your family. That happened and to tell that story is Dr. Dick McLaughlin and the fact that he's here means that we had a happy ending and there's a reason for that and Dr. McLaughlin is going to tell us all about that. So on behalf of the Florida Air Museum, I welcome all of you to the 38th Annual Sun Fun Fly-In. You're here at the Florida Air Museum. We've got a series of forums and this is just another one that I can't wait to introduce. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Dick McLaughlin. Bahamas Habitat uh, published after the earthquake in Haiti two years ago uh, that anybody, any willing pilot who would uh, fly supplies down to the... Uh, still can't hear me? Well, sit up close, honey. Come on in here. <laughs> I can't scream too much louder. I uh, answered the uh, email from uh, John Armstrong at Bahamas Habitat and uh, signed up. And I had the wrong plane. I had a Cirrus. But you could put about 600 pounds of stuff in that, so I did, and uh, flew to uh, Nassau, where I met a bunch of children, Cameron King and a couple of other 23-year-olds who had been working for Bahamas Habitat. It's sort of a Methodist outfit that is a lot like Habitat for Humanity. They built houses, uh, the thing that Jimmy Carter started up. Well, they, a flight instructor from Tennessee, Steve Merritt, thought it would be really fun to run Bahamas Habitat because then he could fly to the Bahamas all the time, and I think he's right. It's a beautiful fly-in, and the water's beautiful, and just gorgeous. So I flew into Nassau, I met all these kids, they were 22 or 3. They'd been sort of running a little sleepy mission, and now they were running FedEx. And they moved about 3 or 4 million pounds of uh, stuff to Haiti out of Nassau, and uh, about 300 pilots. And I was one of them, it was a big time. We uh, flew the Sierras down to Pignon, I hadn't really landed the Sierras on a grass field before, and dropped off a bunch of stuff at a an orphanage and uh, came back for more and flew down to Lakai and came back for more and then uh, by then somebody in the NASDAQ had put it, uh, his, uh, gotten smoke in the cockpit and he landed his plane in the water, he ditched it and uh, the guy had a, a raft and a life jacket and a sats phone and a cigar and he got out on the wing and he had his life jacket on and he inflated his raft right side up, I'll get to that later, and then uh, he called his wife and said, tell them to come get me, and he had the lats and lungs from the sat phone, and then he lit the cigar, and by the time he was done, they got him, and it sounded great. So up until then, I had had a life jacket, but I thought, oh, might be good idea to get a raft. And they wouldn't let single-engine pistons fly over that length of water with missionaries anymore. The job had been to fly stuff in and people out. So I stopped that and I flew down and worked with a surgeon in Lakai, a guy named Bill Tenhoff, who had run a missionary hospital in Togo where he learned French for 10 years, 12 years with his wife and little kids who got bigger and bigger. And about the time they were going to need a little scratch to go to college, he ran out of money completely. His mission was closed, his wife was bitter, they moved to northern Michigan where he became an urgent care doctor. and talked her into one week a month missionary work. He said, I'll work this schedule and then run down there to Lakai and do surgery. And he's quite a guy. He, uh, he runs a serious hospital one week a month. He's got two Haitian doctors who run it in his absence. And I thought, I think I can talk my wife into this. So I did, and I had my partners, and we took a little pay cut. We took them, we started going. And I went to Lakai, and I went to Pignon, and I went to 
Guadalupe and I went to Ba Limbe, and if you get a chance, you should go to Ba Limbe because the Canadians have figured it out. It's a way to get all Canadian doctors from anywhere in Canada to come, come down there. They staff it completely all winter long because it's like a scene out of South Pacific. It's a beautiful, gorgeous water. And after a clinic, oh, I think it's about two, let's go swim over to the island and picnic. It's really pretty nice for Haiti. I wasn't telling anybody. I thought my partners would uh, be mad at me. Anyhow, I finally met up with the folks at St. Damien's in, uh, in uh, Port-au-Prince around the time that cholera started, and I used to be a cholera doctor in Bangladesh 30 years ago. So I thought Haiti had finally thrown a pitch I could hit. And I've been going down there one week a month ever since. And it, after a while, we got that sort of better, and uh, I, I'm a GI doctor, so I opened a GI lab at uh, St. Luke's Hospital, it's called, and we've been having a good time. I, the, the system, you know, Haiti's for Haitians, you're not going to change things there, really. So my plan is, is to run this GI lab. I have Dr. Natalie Colon as my GI fellow down there. She runs it in my absence, builds up the caseload. We come down for a week a month, and off we go. So that's what I've been doing. I took one of my sons and took my daughter, Mara. I took my other son, he didn't much want to go, but he sort of liked it. I took my wife a few times. I usually take somebody down with me if I can. They're kind of long, sleepy legs from Fort Pierce down to Port of Prince to get them. It's nice to have company. I took my daughter, Elaine, for the first time, and it kills me that we don't have a picture of her because she's cute. And I think you could sell parachutes with cute. We had an uh, alternator problem in December, and I got a great guy from Mission Aviation Fellowship down in Port of Prince to replace the alternator and flew it back to Tam Miami. We were due for the annual. I needed a starter. Various things I knew. A lot of work got done on the plane. They flew it for an hour on January 6th. I came down that night and flew January 7th for an hour while Elaine went and got cameras. She couldn't find a good camera, so she got a throwaway camera that was wrapped in aluminum foil. And we took the cowling off and looked around and let's go. Well, an hour later, south of Tam Miami and west of Andros, the uh, 9,500 feet, the oil pressure starts to fade from 50, which is normal, to 40, and I think I just had a lot of stuff done, including moving the oil filter and some of the oil lines, I think I'm going to go to Andros. So I announced that I was going to divert, and uh, the oil pressure fell to 30, and then to 20, and I was still about 45 miles offshore, and then 10, and then zero. And then the uh, engine seized, and the propeller locked up, and there's no more checklist after that. We're kind of done. As serious is easy to get the best line, you pull back on the trim, all the way back, and then you're going down about six or 700 feet a minute, which will get you from 9,500 feet about two miles offshore. And that's what it did. And uh, my daughter, who was very graciously quiet for most of this, didn't start punching me or saying, you know, I didn't really want to come here in the first place. Very quiet. Uh, and I was getting quieter and quieter. My voice was like a little bit. I don't know if, I've any, if any of you have had or, ever been in one of these positions where you, you think you really might die. It, it changes how you function. It changes how you think. It, it, it did me. It may not you, but it narrowed my focus so tightly that I was aware that I was uh, becoming a fairly incompetent pilot. I, I have an R9 out of the no series. They got everything on that cockpit. And you can find the Latin longs are right up front left, first page. And some helpful pilot, you know, you get on 121.5 and you start talking to Miami Center, and pretty soon you have a lot of company because everybody's listening on 121.5, or you should, over the water, and they're all talking. And uh, so a helpful guy says, well, what's your latitude and longitude? And I am aiming right at St. Andrews, and I have just got it at best glide. And I am not looking at the right page because I'm looking at that oil pressure because it's going like this, and the cylinder head temperatures are going like this. And I think, I'll just get that, and I start pushing the buttons and pretty soon, I'm still looking for the lats and longs, and I'm going 130 instead of 90, and I'm about 50 degrees off course. And I thought, well, stand by. Because I was past my point of being a competent pilot. I could keep the wings level. I could keep the nose pointed in the right direction. And I was just waiting to see, am I going to pull this chute over land or over mangrove swamp? A decision I had really made a couple of years ago. I do a lot of this flying over water. And you can ditch, and 90% of people live through ditching. and 90% of them survive the experience. 
which is 81% of the total. And this year's is a fixed year, and I heard some information to the effect that if you land a fixed gear on the gear, you're going to flip. If you flip, you might or might not break the windshield. If you break the windshield, you'll be inverted underwater with your daughter to your right, and you're in trouble. So I pulled the chute at 2,300 feet or so. I'm, it's tantalizingly close. I think, I think I can make land. I think I can make land. Oh, hell, that I don't care if I can make land or not. I pulled the chute, and it is... Uh, I had been through the uh, sim. There's a simulator in Atlanta, and they're expensive and inconvenient and really a good idea. Sim flying is a, the only thing we can do is 91 pilots to get close to 135 types. They train in the sim a couple times a year. They do 30 approaches. They fail everything in the plane. It's really better spent money than flying around with an instructor. But it's a lot of money, so I hardly ever spent it. I did it once, and I uh, spent about three hours in the sim, and we pulled the chute a few times. And uh, you have to go, in the Cirrus, they say, to go less than 133 uh, knots to pull it. Some guys have pulled a little faster and made it. The, uh, we were going about 90, which is about best glide in a Cirrus. And you go from 90 to nothing in about two seconds, which is quite a shock. And then uh, the rear is where the uh, rocket is deployed. It shoots out the back. And uh, so you hang from that one uh, riser while the other risers rip out of the underside of the doors. And the, if you don't have an engine making a lot of, you know, that disturbing noise that makes everything so hard to hear, the risers really, really make a lot of noise. <laughs> I thought, oh, the chute's ripped. I'm going to have to ditch it after a while. It straightens you out. You come down flat, 17 knots, slightly turning. Hit the water pretty hard. Feel it in your coccyx. Feel it up your back. That's it. Are you all right? I'm all right. There's a little bird's eye uh, air vents in the Cirrus. We must have had a little forward momentum because maybe a gallon of water came through each vent, which we had not closed. And uh, so we had about a gallon of water in our laps, and so we thought we were going to go under right away. Uh, as I thought about it later, I think that the, uh, our feet were probably dry. But uh, anyhow, Elaine had a hard time with her seatbelt. Couldn't get it undone. My door opened fine. My seatbelt came off. I had, you know, I had a money bag with passport and credit cards and all the stuff you really don't want to lose track over one shoulder and under the other. And had uh, these glasses. Well, not these exactly, because these are somewhere in the Caribbean. So now I'm going to wear a little lanyard, because then after that, I can't really see so well without glasses. At any rate, Elaine's seatbelt was easy to undo. I sort of threw her out my door and she landed on the wing looking fine and fell right in the water looking really cold and frightened. Don't worry, honey, I, I got this raft. And there's a raft, a really tiny raft behind the back seat and I stand out on the wing and pull that brickboard. And the raft deploys, hop right in there, darling. And we don't realize that the raft is upside down for another half an hour or so. I have a PLB, my friend Bruce Brown's PLB that I borrowed that I had kept connected to the raft. Apparently, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to keep it on your belt, which I do now. But uh, the state of our awareness at the time was still impaired. We were laughing. We got out on the wing and uh, jumped on the raft, and we just started laughing. It's good to be alive. We felt fine. The water wasn't that cold. Pretty soon, uh, I had pulled the, uh, you know, the money bag and all that business out and thrown it into the back seat with everything else, headsets and all. And... But we were waiting for the plane to sink, and it didn't. It kind of nosed in. We were in about 10 feet of water. It sort of nosed in, and stuff started floating out of the plane. Here comes the passport. A couple of oranges, some snacks. That little throwaway camera, Rathen. So we took some pictures. I think this. We took some pictures, which I don't think we're going to show you right now. And we waited for a little while, and the Coast Guard came. First uh, in a fixed wing, and they circled. And Elaine said, well, how are they going to get us? Oh, honey, I don't think they are, but it's really good to see them. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the Coast Guard version of a Black Hawk came, and they dropped the swimmer, and he swam over and said, everybody OK? We're going to put you in a basket. Up you go. And that's how we got to Nassau that day. It took us another day to get to Haiti, but everybody was fine. Everybody was fine. So 
although uh, when I first bought a Cirrus, I thought I'd get it because I liked how fast it went, and uh, it was pretty fuel efficient, and you go pretty far with it. Now I've got a whole other reason to buy a Cirrus. I really, really believe in a parachute. I could have ditched it. 90% of people do survive the ditch, and 90% of them don't drown. 81% would have made it, I guess. I, I, it was very hard to figure a way that we could have come out of this better than we did. There were no injuries, and we weren't disoriented, and nothing bad happened. But we were ready to go about our business the, day, the next day. So that is my story. Pulling a parachute over wide open water. And I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Boris Popov, who uh, created the uh, ballistic recovery system uh, to which we owe our lives. Boris, come up here. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. That's, uh, you know, people ask me what's the best way to promote your product. And I can't think of a better way than to have a face-to-face -face meeting with somebody that actually has deployed a parachute. There are any of the naysayers out there. All you have to do is listen to competent pilots, experienced pilots, and why they chose to deploy a parachute. We're going to be doing these, these forums at Oshkosh and at Lakeland going forward as well as uh, today. This is just our first first time. And again, the reason I'm choosing this, this venue is to, what better way, again, I want to stress, than to have people like Dick come up and explain why he chose to use a parachute, why he chose to buy an airplane with a parachute. Because there still are naysayers out there. There's still people who doubt the, the efficiency and the potential for life saving of a parachute on an airplane. Uh, these forums, I think, are going to be an important venue to, to continue to promote the concept of, of what we call whole air freight parachute devices. We have 276 saves uh, over the last 30 years, and one of the most startling statistics that, that I sort of uh, realized here about a year ago is that one out of 125 of our parachutes that we sell gets deployed. One out of 125 gets deployed. So. I don't want to promote that because it sort of indicates the, the difficulty of flying small airplanes and the danger of flying small airplanes, and that's my industry, and I certainly don't want to be a proponent of that, but the fact of the matter is, after 30 years and 30,000 systems, we've got about almost 300 saves. That's, that's the facts, so uh, we let them speak for themselves. Keeping life in a good-natured perspective is a common practice of pilots. Come on, come on. Rancher Albert Kolk will tell you that, especially after the flying adventure he, his grandson Jordan, and two friends endured on a night flight back from Seattle, crossing the rugged Manashee Mountains in British Columbia. It was a beautiful night. We were, uh, as we climbed to 9,500 feet, uh, we could see a starlit sky and we could see the peaks below us, the snowy peaks, and uh, down lower there was some dark green, of course, of the trees and some light grays. You could distinguish that. You could distinguish the odd river and some water below, but that's about all. There was no moon, but uh, very bright, clear night. So everything was going well until uh, something went wrong. And then he said shoot, and I remembered, and all of a sudden, just like everything kind of put it in perspective a bit. It was a lot nicer. You. You, you realize that you do have some security, some safety in that? I hollered, shoot, seat belts, and I pulled back the power, turned off the ignition, and whatever needed to be done. Then I pulled the chute. There was a little explosion, which was good to hear. It's kind of loud, but it's good to hear that explosion. But what was even better to hear when that parachute started deploy, and when when it first starts to deploy, there's that ring above that that holds it for a ways, and then it starts to deploy more and more, and that's just such a gorgeous feeling. <sighs> it is holding, and we're going down on the chute, the whole pair airplane, and that was just a such a beautiful feeling, a feeling of comfort and comfort and joy, you might say. Albert's airplane eventually floated safely to the ground, threading the needle on his way down through a small opening between some tall trees and coming to rest on a steep, sloped rock pile. 
we got a great landing. The, the parachute hooked a tree and it brought us around really slowly and set us down on, it was a fairly steep incline, but it was set us down in a really nice place. There was no trees, there was trees on both sides of us, but not where we landed. It was almost the perfect landing spot. And you all walked away. Yeah, everybody got out of the plane and walked away without a bruise, without a scratch, without anything. What is your life worth? What is the life of your loved ones worth? The ones you carry, whether it's your grandson or granddaughter or child or girlfriend or wife? What's that life worth? Can you count that in dollars and cents? No way. Pull a shoot, you walk away.